Okay. Um, we are very pleased today to host Dr. Um, Doris Gray here at uh, Yale University um, uh, for a discussion about her latest book. Um, uh, today will be uh, with us also Dr. Leslie Ross Ritten, who will be discussing with uh, Dr. Gray her book. And uh, I am the facilitator. My name is Nizam Bissari, and I'm a Rice Scholar here at Yale University. So, um, Dr. Gray directed the Hillary Clinton Center for Women Empowerment at Al Ahawan University in Fran, Morocco, for seven years where she also served as professor of women and gender studies. She now resides in Berlin, Germany, and serves as honorary professor at Roskilde University in Denmark. Uh, before becoming an academic, Dr. Gray was a journalist for the German press agency. She reported as a foreign correspondent from South Africa, and then for 10 years from her base in Nairobi, Kenya. In addition to a number of books, chapters and scholarly articles. She has published four books, the latest of which we will be discussing today. Uh, so the, the book is Living the Shadow of Pain, Cross-Cultural Exploration uh, of Truth, Trauma, Reconciliation and Healing, uh, published by Logos Verlag in 2020. Um, her other books are Women and Social Change in North Africa, What Counts as Revolutionary by Cambridge University Press, uh, Beyond Feminism and Islamism, Gender and Equality in North Africa by I.B. Taurus, and uh, Muslim Women on the Move, Moroccan Women and French Women of Moroccan Origin Speak Out by Roman and Ikufi. Uh, she also has published advocacy publications with the International Center for Transnational Justice in, in New York, uh, Who Hears My Voice Today, Indirect Women Victims in Tunisia, which she presented at Yale University uh, precisely in the fall of 2018. To discuss her book with her, we have uh, Dr. Leslie cross -Wilton. Uh She is a lecturer in African Studies and Middle uh, East Studies and affiliated faculty with the Department of Anthropology and the Center for Race, Indigeneity and Transnational Migration at Yale University. She is a political geographer. Her work focuses on the relationships between borders, race and political economy between Africa and Europe. Um, her first book project Bordering, uh, with the title Bordering Blackness, Race, Migration and the Political Economy of Violence in Morocco was funded by the National Science Foundation for Bright Hayes and Fellowships at Yale. She has also published uh, or has forthcoming articles in uh, Society and Space, the Journal of North African Studies, where she was the editor of the co-editor of a special issue on migration in North Africa, ACME, a journal of critical uh, geography and geofor. Um, one of her uh, articles uh, 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 on the issue of COVID has been widely discussed, and uh, so uh, she brings uh, because she brings to it a different eye on the issue of uh, the pandemic. Um, she is a member of the uh, of the Doctors Without Within Borders Research Group, Glasgow University and Lancaster University, and the Council of Geographies Working Group uh, of the RGS. IBG and the former instructor with Yale's Prison Education Initiative. She is also engaged in a long-standing project with artist Heather Parrish entitled Border Work, which explores how interdisciplinary collaborations can help us address pressing social and political issues today. So uh, without further ado, I give the floor to Dr. Gross Witten for uh, to start the debate. But uh, for our audience uh, uh, online, please uh, uh, ask your questions in the Q&A part of uh, the, the, your screen. And I will be happy to share those questions with uh, our two guests. Thank Leslie. you. Yeah, thank you, Nizar. It's a, it's a delight to be here today um, and to talk to you. <laughs> Dr. Gray, who I'm now going to call Doris, <laughs> as, I, as I will call Dr. Masari Nizar. <laughs> um, 
for the rest of the session. And again, I just want to welcome our in-person guests. This is our first uh, hybrid in-person and online gathering and, and those who are gathering online as well. And please feel free to ask questions at any point during the discussion, but we'll spend about the first 20 to 30 minutes um, where I will pose some questions to Doris and she'll answer and then we'll kind of open it up to any other questions that, that come. And we anticipate um, this being about an hour conversation in total. Um, so really what we're here to do today is to talk about uh, Dr. Gray's latest book, which uh, these are introduced, Leaving the Shadow of Pain, Cross-Cultural Exploration of Truth, Trauma, and Healing. And, um, and I'm going to address my questions mostly to that. And then we might have time to kind of open it up to think about some of your other work on, um, on women, political activism, and Islamism, or the role of religion in sort of uh, women's exercise in public space and, and how, what that looks like in North Africa. Um, but I really wanted to focus on the book and ask you to give us a little bit of sort of an overview of what the book is about and also what brought you to that project at this point kind of in your career? Well, thank you, everybody. Um, what is really nice is when you have fellow scholars, also personal friends. <laughs> so in Morocco, Nizar was not only my friend, but also was my boss with whom I developed the activities at the Hillary Clinton Center. And Leslie, with her family, we did many trips to very remote parts of Morocco. So we are scholars, fellow scholars, but we are also really good personal friends, mm -hmm. which I think brings out the best in collaborative scholarship. So thank you very much for having me here yet again at Yale. I'm very happy to be here, even so it's freezing cold today, <laughs> but we'll warm each other up, I hope. Um, this last book I wrote is a departure from all previous books because it's not a scholar, strictly speaking, a scholarly book. It sort of traverses the boundaries between autobiography and scholarship. And the reason why I chose this format was when I started my research in Tunisia and interviewed trauma victims, victims, women who were persecuted, who were in prison, who were tortured, who were raped, et cetera. I always encouraged them to come forward with the truth because I felt national healing cannot occur if people don't know what happened. And you also have to change the national narrative, what happened in a country, what happened in history. And that can only be the case when the truth about what happened to individual citizens comes out. I then encountered a number of women who told me very frankly their stories, their terrible, horrible stories of being brutalized, but said they would not come forward in the Truth and Dignity Commission. They did not want to speak out in public. And I kept urging them, I said, you must do this. This is important for the country to know. But eventually I, of course, had to respect that they said, we don't want to talk about this in public. Little did I know at that time that I come from a family that ha also has big secrets. I did not know when I started my research in Tunisia that my father was Jewish and was a survivor of the Shoah. He had kept that secret from us his entire life. But that secret cast such a deep shadow over our childhood. Our father was a mystery to us. We didn't know why we didn't have any relatives, no grandparents, no uncles, no aunts, no cousins, nothing. And we were never allowed to ask anything. So once I found that out about my dad, I began to rethink the question, who has a right to the truth? I told these women in Tunisia, you need to come forward to the with the truth. I accused my dad and said, why didn't you tell us earlier? I'm your child. I have a right to the truth. And my father said, I have a right to the truth too. It is my right to speak out or to remain silent. And I was afraid to speak out. I wanted to protect you. And that's why I couldn't speak out. 
which is much the same reason why the women in Tunisia didn't want to speak out. So I felt, even so I had no idea that I had that background. Once I found out from my own family history, I saw there is a real direct link between your biography and your scholarship. And that we should acknowledge that link. So that's, I don't know if that answers your question. That's how I came about this project. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I think something that's really important about that for me, I mean, thinking as someone who's worked for a long time at the intersection of uh, feminist, you know, mm -hmm. feminist research uh, in, in North Africa, I think that, you know, there always is this emphasis in, in feminist scholarship about locating yourself as a researcher and also recognizing that your perspective, um, you know, influences the way that you ask questions, the way that people respond to those questions, the way that you interpret or make sense of them. And so I think that our biographies are often implicitly drawn into our research mm -hmm. projects, whether or not we realize them or not. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, um, you know, sometimes they come to the floor in ways that are maybe a lot more um, visible um, or, or, you know, there's so many more parallels, but I think nonetheless, there's always some profound ways in which we are humans with histories and connections that influence the way that we understand the world. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so that, that completely makes sense to me. Um, I'm wondering if we can back up just a little bit. Um, this, is, this is a Council for Middle East Studies mm -hmm. uh, event, but it also you know, is open to a broader public, um, both at Yale and, and beyond. And so I wondered if you could just talk for just a couple of minutes about sort of the post-World War II transition like that, what that was like for folks kind of one thing that struck me about your book is just really imagining what it was like for people like your dad um, who had to live side by side um, mm -hmm. with people who'd been Nazis, right? Like, like, and, and just, you know, this, the parents of schoolmates that you were friends with or things like that, what that was like, and just maybe speak a little bit to that, the sort of social reconstruction after World War II. And then, um, and then likewise, maybe a little bit about the post 2010 Tunisia transition and the process of transitional justice or uh, truth and reconciliation. I think it's called dignity. And yeah, truth and dignity. Truth mm -hmm. and dignity in Tunisia. So mm -hmm. kind of giving us some historical context. When there is regime change, it is exactly that. The regime changes, but the people don't change. You're still dealing with the same people. So, for somebody who has been a victim of state-sanctioned torture or state-sanctioned violence, how is that person supposed to have trust in this new regime that consists of a few new people, but the whole administration and the under uh, body is still the same people? So we expect from victims to have trust and confidence in a system that where the system has changed, but the people haven't changed. That is not very trust inspiring. So I think for people of uh, st state sanctioned violence, the fear continues to be a very big factor in how they reorganize their life. And there may be, as it was in Germany, very public acknowledgement of, of uh, World War II uh, crimes. Mm -hmm. They were the Nuremberg trials, the first such trials in history. But it was always, this is sort of what happened in the country. It was not personalized. These are the people who did it, and these are the people who are victims. So of course, all my childhood, I heard about World War II, I learned about the Shoah, but it was always some people who, some other people who were involved in this. They were the people that were tried at the Nuremberg trials, but all sort of the, the guards or the soldiers, they were all people we didn't know, or so we thought. And likewise for the people in Tunisia, they now are liberated from prison, but they're living in the same neighborhoods as their former torturers. They see each other in the street. So how do you expect 
somebody to really heal when there is this deep, deep fear of being re-victimized. And this, when trust has really been destroyed, these authoritarian system, systems in Tunisia and in World War II, Germany, and then later again in uh, uh, communist East Germany, what these systems do, do, they erode the trust of one citizen to another because citizens are encouraged to betray their neighbor, to betray their family member. And so once that trust at the family or small scale micro level gets betrayed, it is very difficult to build a healthy society because you can't turn on a switch and say, trust again, trust us. That hadn't worked in the past. So what are the mechanisms through which individual people can heal when the state does not provide, assure you of judicial redress. And then another thing I just wanted to mention, um, the way I came about with my research, when I spoke with the women in Tunisia, I never talk about myself. I'm, you know, I'm sort of in scholar mode and I don't talk about myself. But it happened frequently that a woman would grab my hand and say, are you one of us? And I didn't know what to make of that. Why would they think I'm not Muslim? I'm not Tunisian. I never was in prison. I haven't been tortured in the same way they have. But they felt that there was something there. And then I thought there is such a deep connection between human beings that really transcends culture, religion, history, sense of place. There is something we know about each other that we can connect to. And likewise, when I found out about my dad's fate, I was telling my late uh, mother-in-law who's African-American. And I said, imagine my dad is Jewish and survived the Shoah. And my mother-in-law said, not surprised, one victim can smell another. And so I felt we have something so deep in common that scholarship should really, or the goal of scholarship should maybe be to remove these barriers that keep us as, that keep us from being compassionate barriers by religion, by ethnicity, by political system, by social class, by ethnicity, whatever. These are all humanly created barriers. So in the best sense, scholarship and teaching should maybe aim at removing these barriers and tapping into that innate sense of compassion and humanity that we share. Thanks. Um, I think and just to kind of add to the comment or your comments about the Tunisian transition period, I think one thing that was significant about you talking to these women and maybe also why they responded to you was that in, in many ways they were left out of the process, I believe, mm -hmm. because um, as I recall in your book, you talked about how um, the, um, you know, the, the process uh, of telling the truth usually targeted um, people who are sort of the firsthand people who experienced, mm -hmm. you know, experienced state repression or mm -hmm. whatever it was. And so a lot of times those were men who were political prisoners, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And there was less attention given to the women who maybe were, um, lost their jobs as a result of mm -hmm. that stigma or, and couldn't provide for their children mm -hmm. or were ostracized in the community. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, yeah, so I think that's a really important maybe thing to add that I think being a researcher that's maybe present and willing to really listen broadly and more open gets a much richer and textured picture of what of what's going on that's that's um, social maybe rather than indivi just individual and not quite so cause and effect but more um, kind of networked relationships and how they play out across time and across generations like you mm -hmm. said. Um, so I, yeah, uh, and so, but I want to, I guess I have two questions. I'm trying to think which one I'm going to say first. I'm going to stay with the method, the methodological mm -hmm. for a minute. 
Um, so, okay, so you've already said that when you first came to the field in Tunisia and we're talking to women about um, this process of transitional justice and um, truth telling mm -hmm. um, in regime change, that you were at first urging women to tell the truth, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and then after a little while later, you said at first you didn't really feel like you should talk about yourself or bring yourself into mm -hmm. the picture. And so I'm wondering now, and we're already getting a lot of this like sense of this from you talking, how do you think about your role as a researcher in the field, right? Like, what does that look like? And I guess I'm thinking in particular about, especially when we're thinking of issues of trauma, what sorts of responsibilities do you have to your interlocutors? Um, when you're doing research, what responsibilities remain after you leave? Um, and maybe that sort of implies a one-way directionality, right? But I'm also thinking about sort of the reci reciprocity, what sorts of relationships just continue and in what ways, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So maybe the first thing I found is when you conduct interviews with people, what they tell you most of the time is only the tip of what was really going on. So you cannot just rely on what a person tells you and think from that you can have a good sense of what the whole story is. As a researcher, I have learned that what a person tells you is maybe that little bit of what their real experience is like. So I think that is very important because we sometimes take that at face value and then say, this is what happened. And I came to understand that what I'm being told is only a fraction of what really occurred. Then the other thing I've, I kind of learned is when I did conducted these interviews with people, I was always very clear that I had nothing to offer them. I had no money, I had no access to political powers. I could not influence the transitional justice process in Tunisia. I had very little to bring to the table. But I said, what I always told the women, what, what I can bring is very little, but what I bring is I can assure you that I will make sure that your story will be told that your story will be made known to the world and that you have a place in history. That's the only thing I can do. And I was really deeply surprised how much that little that I could do meant to people. And they poured their testimonies and poured and poured and poured. And you know, these stories of torture are very similar. So as a researcher, I felt I've heard like 15 the same story. I don't need to hear another 15. But when women grabbed onto me and said, are you going to listen to me too? I couldn't say, oh, no, my research is done. I, I've got enough material. I felt it was then my responsibility to say, I'm here to validate your life story. If nobody else does, I'm here and I'm listening. And my Arabic is very shuya, so I don't really understand. I said, just speak in Arabic, it doesn't matter. I will listen. And I, since I sort of knew what the stories were going to contain, and I could hear in their voice, in the way they conveyed what they were saying, um, what they were telling me. And I felt as a scholar, your first responsibility is to be a human being and to make sure it's understood we are in this process together. You are the victim who's telling me a story that I then make, can make public, but it's a joint endeavor. I'm not trying to extract something from you that I then use for advancing my own career. Even so, that is what happens, but you have to have the humility to, say, to invest a lot more time than what is strictly speaking necessary in order to conduct your research. I think you owe that to the people uh, that you're with. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And I think too, um, I think time is one of the things that you hear people, like it has so much value and just broadly speaking, we don't confer enough of it on each other, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of the time, but I think that in the field and after the field, like being available or having time to listen and spend time and not, you know, not cut it off is, is, 
it, it, it does have a value in, mm -hmm. in and of itself. So. Could I just add something to that? So about that time, you know, when I came back to Tunisia, I often would get phone calls from people saying, aren't you the one who is the listening person? Can I also tell you my story? And that happened years later that I would get calls and say, aren't you the listening person? And can we also come and tell you our story? So it just validates a human existence. If there is somebody willing to receive every detail, whatever you want to say, and even if you, as is the case with trauma victims, they repeat the same story over and over and over again. And you don't interrupt and say, check, I got it. You let that person determine when they are finished telling their story. Yeah. Um, well, I'm just not gonna take, I'm just gonna take five more minutes and then so, if we have questions, I'll open it up. No, it's fine. I always prepare way too many questions, but I wanna get to this one. Um, mm -hmm. And this is, as all my questions are, sort of multi-part, um, but you're, you know, in this book, uh, you're talking about this writing, this process of writing and the book itself as an exploration of truth. And for me, again, time comes up, right? Um, and you already, you gestured to this already. How do we think about or navigate when to speak the truth? sort of as individuals and then also as maybe publics, like how we encourage truth telling for the process of reconciliation, right? Or regime change, like how, so when do we know how to tell the truth or, or when do we encourage it and to whom? Like those seem like it, questions that came up in your book. Um, when do we speak the truth or when do we want people to speak the truth? And then the audience really matters in terms of, to whom do we want to speak the truth or to whom are we supposed to speak the truth? Like those don't always mean the same thing. Does that sort of mm -hmm. make sense to you? I hope I understand. If not, then just yeah, yeah. stop me. Um, from the viewpoint of somebody who was a victim, I think we need to concede to them the point at which they want to come forward. And that may be very different for different people. And generally people come forward when they feel some kind of assurance of non-recurrence of violence. And that can only be determined by the person themselves, by the individual themselves. So for myself, my own story, I felt I could only tell it after my dad had passed because I knew he was afraid all his life and he would have felt betrayed. He kept his identity a secret. So it wasn't for me to reveal it. So I felt I couldn't write about this until he was dead. Um, with some other uh, things I write about in the book that had uh, happened in my own life, I felt often when you're talking about not just interpersonal violence, but violence that is in some way sanctioned by the state, people in positions of authority take over the narrative of your story. They feel they have the power and the authority to tell what happened. And that's the history that is written into history books. That's the, history, the, uh, the story that is conveyed into policy under Geert's policy. And I felt at some point I needed to own my own story and say, this was about me. So I need to tell it how I experienced it. And people in positions of authority should, even if they don't like it, and even if they say this is wrong and this didn't happen that way, this is how I experienced it. And since I had never written a book like that, I, I can't tell you how empowering this was mm -hmm. to rest the story of violence away from the people who had the power to tell it their way, to say, actually, I'm the one here who experienced this, and this is how it looked like from my perspective. But again, I only wrote this after I had nothing to lose in, in Morocco, for example, anymore. So I was very, very conscious that I could not risk being re-traumatized and have 
when I told honestly what I experienced, have that again taken away from me by somebody um, imposing their will over mine. I think that that makes a lot of sense. And I think it it speaks maybe to some of the challenges with transitional justice, right? Because mm -hmm. it is it is designed to provide healing within a, a society, but ultimately to legitimize a regime change or you know, some sort right. of transition. Um, and sometimes those things are at odds, right? Or even healing uh, of society as a whole is not the same as healing of particular individuals within it. So right. it's a complicated thing. Um, I'm going to ask if we have questions. Well, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I'll open it up. If people have questions, please submit them. I have a few more questions of my own, but I'd love to hear from other folks too. Um, so I guess, yeah. So I guess I want to think about sort of the broader implications of this, maybe even from the position of the university, which is, you know, where we are right now. And I'm thinking in particular about like this truth telling and who tells the truth, when they tell the truth, to whom they tell the truth. And I'm thinking about um, two things come to my mind that you can or, or cannot comment on. It's up to you. And these are, you can weigh in too if you want, um, or the audience. Uh, but I'm thinking first about fake news. And, and like, we're talking about truth as though truth isn't like under, con under fire right now in, in ways that perhaps have always been, but I think there's a new uh, level in which the truth is being attacked. And, and an example that I will give um, is both, there's two sides of a coin. There's the Me Too movement and the way women have brought the truth of um, accusations of sexual violence um, to the public and often have been um, attacked for those. And then in particular cases in North Africa, very recently, some um, Morocco, for example, has mobilized accusations against um, critics of the state has mobilized Me Too accusations against critics of the state in order to silence them. And so I'm wondering about like how we wrestle with this truth telling in the age of fake news or the age of mobilizing it for particular political projects. Right. I think that goes very much to the heart of what I think is an important question. What is the purpose of truth telling? It isn't just about truth telling in a vacuum, but what is the goal? What is the purpose? What, who needs to hear the truth and who needs to tell the truth? Um, and it's not just, how should I say? You have to also wisely choose the moment in which truth can be received. When you know the powers to whom you are telling this truth, you completely reaching deaf ears. It's a waste of time, right? So you have to find a, a, a little opening. Here is someone or some little crack in the system where people are open to receive what they are going to hear. And not like, oh, what you're saying is not true or this is not how it happened. And you just have a personal vendetta. and from most people who were victims of state sanctioned silence, vendetta has never been their goal, which is to me truly amazing that people were not out to get the people who did terrible things to them. What they wanted is to heal. They didn't want to have other people injured. And I think from the viewpoint of perpetrators, there is tremendous fear. What would happen if the person that I victimized is doing to me what I did to them? And therefore there is tremendous resistance to listening. But most victims, that, at least the ones I encountered, do not want vengeance. They would like to come to terms and find peace with their life experience. Um, so, I'm somewhat struggling with this term, my truth, because either this is a table or it's not, but it's not a piece of cake. You know, it's not like my truth is this is cake and your truth is that this is a table. You know, some, some truths are not debatable. 
um, with fake news, I mean, that's a whole political, uh, <laughs> a very political, large issue. What I would maybe, that's too much for me to address, I think. But what I can address is that one should think about why is the truth important and what goal does it serve? Is the goal to further divide us? Is the goal to further alienate us from each other? Or is the goal to, with this truth, we can now all come together and find some place of healing? And that, I think, often gets forgotten, that the goal of truth-telling is that we as human beings can continue to exist with ourselves and with each other. And it's not like you are right and I'm wrong and this is terrible because now you are right and I'm wrong and maybe it should be the other way around. It's not about right or wrong. Eventually, when it comes to the judicial procedures, of course, it's about right or wrong. But for the individual human being to heal, it's not so much about right and wrong, but how can we continue to exist together in the face of what we both experienced? whether as a perpetrator or as a victim. I think you have a story in your book. Now I'm trying to remember, but I think there was a story about men gathering together with their perpetrator. Is, am I right? Yes. Could you, could you say something about Yeah, so about this that? was uh, two really remarkable events, I think, truly remarkable. Uh, this were with men, not with women, because the first incidents of truth telling involved men. So I was at an event where some former prisoners of conscience uh, told their story in public before the Truth and Dignity Commission really got going. So in came a man uh, with a cane who couldn't walk very properly and he was held by another man on whom he leaned and he sat down, he told his story of what had happened to him in prison and how he was tortured and this and that. And then there was Q&A. And I thought just out as a matter of politeness, I said, would you mind introducing the person that's sitting next to you? I figured it was his uncle or his brother and just acknowledge the presence of this other person. And he said, oh yeah, he's the one who did all this to me. He was my torturer. And there was of course, complete silence in the room. And then he said, this man knows me better than anybody in the world. And he was pressured to do this. I know the difference between a sadist and somebody who inflicts violence because he himself was under pressure. And he said, we shared the worst moments of our life together, me on the receiving end and he on the giving end. But that brought us together that experience truly brought us together. And the other one was, we were driving around Bizert up to the prison with a couple of former, former prisoners. Um, and they, they said, can we show you our former home? I said, your former home, okay. And they said, okay, the prison, we spent 15 years in that, that prison. So we drive these winding roads up the Mediterranean and, and to the prison. And then out comes the guard and they were chit-chatting with the guard and then and laughing. And then later I said, what was that all about? And they said, well, we are out, we are free. He is still in the prison. He is still a prison, he's still behind bars. And you know, we spent 15 years together, we really know each other but we are now free and he's still a prison guard. But I, I found it overwhelming, the humanity that these men showed. And I said, aren't you resentful? And they said, no, we won the revolution. We have a new state. We have no time to be resentful. We, we're busy building our new state. I think those were the incidents. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I have a question here from uh, Maureen Shanahan. Um, so, um, Doris, 
Thanks so much for your wonderful talk. I look forward to reading your book. I'm wondering what you think about the Holocaust and other trauma studies literature that is often less focused on truth, uh, uh, between quote, um, and instead on how survivors' stories are uh, op open quote, emotionally laden, close it, even if not always factually correct. In other words, there is an experiential truth that is more important than documentary than, than documentary evidential, for example, legal or historical truth. What do you think about line, uh, uh, that line of thinking? So much. Wow. <laughs> Hi, Maureen, wherever you are. <laughs> um, I would say there is two, two uh, levels on which truth is important. One is on the individual level, the micro level, and one is on the macro level. On the micro level, it is important how a person experienced things, how they felt about things, how they responded to things. And that is highly subjective and maybe historically accurate and have also historical inaccuracies. And then there's the macro level that needs to deal with these instances are not isolated individual occurrences, but they, they were systemic. They happened to millions of people. So you take these, in, these testimonies and from those, these testimonies, you glean what happened on a macro level. So for that to happen, you don't need to have each victim tell their story. You don't need 6 million testimonies in Germany, for example. You need a few testimonies that are representative of the larger uh, crime that was committed. And then you can address it on a macro level. But the macro level and the micro level are very often out of sync. You know, macro level is you have to rebuild, you have to have uh, uh, systemic change, regime change, build a new political system. And on the micro level, you have the individual who is still hurting. Just because you have a new government doesn't mean everything is forgotten and over with. So what does the individual still do? How, how can they heal? And sort of from maybe a philosophical point of view, wrongs are never committed in the abstract. It was a person who did something to another person. It was human beings that did something to other human beings. So um, it's human beings that need to change. It's people, as people, we need to change. Um, it's not just a systemic change. And for, for really um, reconciliation to occur, I think there has to be not just the testimony of the victim, but there needs to be some sense of remorse, not just in public acknowledgement, yes, this is what happened, and this is what happened is wrong. Somebody needs to say, somebody with a position in a position of authority needs to say what happened to you was wrong, and it should have never happened to you. And we are sorry. I think that it's, it's, it seems such an easy thing, thing to say, but it just never happens, right? People in authority, they acknowledge some abstract wrongdoing, but never, you should not have had to experience this. And we as successor rep, successors to people in positions of authority, we take responsibility and apologize. Um, I'm not sure I'm addressing exactly well, what we're one question. thing. Yes, that please, please. I think there are various ways to answer this, but I was also thinking about the like thinking about the role of trauma in 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 um, testimony and in memory, mm -hmm. and, and thinking about this from more refugee liter refugee studies mm -hmm. literature. But 
um, a lot of times refugees have to recount their story over and over oh, again. And yes. if it doesn't match perfectly every time, um, it's considered, you know, false or, you know, the details. But we know a lot more now about trauma, I think. And psychologists have sort of weighed in and said, it's actually quite common for details and things to change because that's part of the effect of trauma and it doesn't make it less true. Um, it doesn't mean the events didn't happen, but it's a really high expectation to expect that every single little um, part of it will match up. Right. And so they, they really um, encourage listening to the effective listening to the emotional register in which um, a lot of that is is taking place uh, as part of the testimony itself. Mm -hmm. And I, I have found that really interesting. And I think also resonant with, you know, what Franz Fanon was saying 50 years, 60 years ago or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I think that's something that I, I don't know if that completely answered the question too, but I think there's a real difference between, you know, documenting just the facts and maybe documenting um, events like I experienced this this direct form of oppression or torture versus, you know, because because of the repressive actions of the state, I experienced I was ostracized for 20 years and also and that dramatically impacted the way that my life has taken has has unfolded. I mean, those are other ways to think about it that are as relevant to right. so yeah. Do you have any other? Um, for the time being, we don't have another. We have a question yes. here. Yes, thank, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit more about um, the sort of how this fits how how this fits into the broader transitional justice context. I'm interested because um, I've been doing a lot of reading on transitional justice and. Bangladesh specifically, and there, and that is an ongoing case of how transitional justice processes that were put in place for very sensible reasons and with good intentions can be co-opted for political purposes that otherwise um, impair and hinder the overall healing process and the country's overall transition to becoming a peaceful post-conflict state. And so I'm wondering, if your scholarship has shed any light on how one can prevent um, transitional justice initiatives from being co-opted for political purposes that would otherwise um, hinder the delivery of such justice and the and, and a and the facilitation of a successful healing process. Um. Most commissions are called Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The Tunisian Commission was unique in that it called itself the Truth and Dignity Commission because it had learned from other truth and reconciliation processes, especially the one in South Africa, that people were pressured to forgive and reconcile in the name of uh, national unity and moving forward. And many did. And then 10 years later said they really regretted it because they were not ready to reconcile. They were not ready to forgive, but they felt they, they, they needed to be these moral heroes who could always rise above what had happened to them and forgive. And I feel that is putting far too much a burden on a victim. Not only are they the victims, they are then have to shoulder the burden of reconciliation and be these superhuman beings who endure torture, have to rise out of this torture and then get up in, often in front of the cameras and say, we forgive. That is expecting too much. That's not the role of a victim to justify or give credence to the new regime. So I feel the emphasis on recon reconciliation in the process of emphasizing reconciliation, it is the focus is on the victim when it really should be on the perpetrator. What are we doing with those people to make sure that they feel some remorse? that they get maybe up in front of the camera and express some remorse and say, we will never do anything like this again, right? So 
The co-opting occurs when you use these transitional justice processes to say, see, the victims reconciled, they forgave, we are good, we can move on. And that in Tunisia has not happened. The people have not been pressured to reconcile or forgive. So I think truth telling would be enough, but you cannot then request or pressure victims to for publicly forgive or to reconcile. That is one. And the other is that transitional justice is a very long process. It usually occurs right after regime change and then for various reasons as in Tunisia, as of last summer, it was halted. Um, in Germany, you had the Nuremberg trials then you had the Auschwitz trials in 1963 and then it sort of fizzled out. And now, as we speak, there are two court cases. One is against a 101-year-old concentration guard camp, uh, concentration camp, camp guard. <laughs> and the other is against a 99-year-old concentration camp guard. And the, the survivors of the camp are also in their late 90s. So some people are saying, what's the point of wheeling you know, a 101 year old person into court. But I would say just there is no expiration date to justice. Justice can always happen. You can't say it's 50 years later, it's 70 years later, so we should close the book. It's an ongoing process that happens with great emphasis shortly after regime change, then it sort of fizzles out. And then when hopefully some kind of democratic stru uh, structure in place, it then comes back up again, many years later. And it's not too late. I mean, it's of course always late, but it's never too late to bring a person to justice. And have a victim know that justice was, even 50 years later, justice was in some way or shape um, attempted. So it's a very long process. And it's not like transitional justice happens like three years and then it's over and then everybody should just move on and forget about it. The trauma is far too deep to be uh, dealt with in three years. How are the two need, how are, I don't know this, so that's mm -hmm. why I'm asking, and you and feel free to chime in and tell us more about the Bangladeshi situation, mm -hmm. but how are Tunisian leaders of the previous regime being held accountable, or are they, or is it more people are telling the truth, it's going on record, but not necessarily, it's not um, part of a process of holding particular people accountable? Some have been held accountable there have been uh, trials and sentences for a few select people where it's completely out of uh, undisputed what they did. Mm -hmm. But of course, as is often the case, it's the lower rank that gets held responsible. And the higher ups are in exile in Saudi Arabia or in their mansion in Southern France or wherever. So, it's generally, you, you're not reaching the top, you're reaching mid-level. Mm -hmm. And then they get resentful because they feel they ultimately were only one, what do you say, keg? Keg? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, or one wheel in the system. Um, in Tunisia, there were some people that were sensed, sentenced. The majority have not. Uh, for reasons of, there was lack of funding, then eventually the, the political will kind of dissipated, then they had the economic crisis, and then they had Corona. So eventually that process, and then when uh, Said Kais took uh, over power last summer, the whole process was halted for the time being. And, and this is what we have been talking about here and previously, is this, the, this dissonance between these two levels, the level of society and the level of the individual. Societies need somehow to bring things to closure and to move on as societies, but individuals are not 
mm -hmm. uh, do not need necessarily to be synchronized with that. So uh, how can we reconcile these two things somehow? <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, Is it possible to reconcile it or you just have to let these two clocks function independently one of the, from the other? I think, um, but that's just my very personal yes. opinion that there would be a whole nother role of the media. I understand that at the political level, state building has to continue. And you can't just always look back. They have to build new institutions, et cetera. But to keep an eye on the victims, I think could be the role of the media, which I feel is often falling down on the job because then they also feel, oh, we have to cover these new political processes and stuff instead of keeping in mind, well, what happened to those victims? Let's just keep that flame alive. So I feel that the media often is just too much in sync with the public processes, rather than saying, we need to keep an eye on those things that are not uh, 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 public events, big government events, but we need to keep an eye on what happened to the people that are left out of this new process. Um, that would be for me one way. And then I think scholarship, I think we as scholars, also have a responsibility to focus on the things that happen that are not the new hot topic, right? This is not the currency that gets me the next promotion, but focus on something. This is, I think it's an important topic, even if nobody cares, but the people I'm dealing with care and they matter. And therefore I'm focusing on that. So I think this is also a responsibility of us scholars to not go with the, the fashions, the, the scholarly fashions, but to find the topics on which there is no attention and say, that is where I can focus my energy. And that maybe can validate some of those individual stories to a limited degree. Well, thank you for... Uh great conversation. Thank you, Doris, for answering the questions openly. And thank you, Leslie, for your engaging questions. I thank our, both our audiences uh, here and online with the, the attendees uh, online uh, for the questions and uh, for their presence here. And uh, we have another session for Council of Middle East Studies very soon uh, uh, on Thursday, I think. Thank you very much. And, Thank you. <laughs>